Good morning, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Um, I'm going to talk about, I mean, we're going to switch gears a little bit, so I'm going to talk about uh, procedure-related coronary obstructions and procedure and device-related coronary obstructions. And those obstructions can happen very early during the procedure, in the hospital before discharge, but also after uh, discharge. These are my conflicts. And basically, this slide uh, by uh, Richard Jabour summarizes what we're facing. So if you look at delayed coronary obstruction, and delayed is defined by coronary obstruction after uh, exiting the, the cath lab, it can occur early, up to seven days, and late after seven days. And then there are several etiologies. There are anatomical risk factors, as expected, the narrow sinus, low coronary height, and excessive calcium. There are also the procedural factors, if you're embarking in a valve and valve procedure, or if you're aiming for a high device position. And also from the previous speaker, we learned that a high device implant might be uh, associated with uh, difficulties in reaccessing the coronaries. And then in terms of a late obstruction, there's again the valve and valve procedure and also some pharmacological issues. What is clear uh, is that uh, if you look at the sinus of Valsalva, you can also look at the distance between the sinus of Valsalva or the coronary ostia and your virtual implant. So the size between the coronary ostia, the distance between the coronary ostia and your stand frame. And we'll get to that later on, but that seems to be a more subtle uh, variable to take into account than just your sinus of Valsalva. Because of course, if you have a large sinus, but you also implant an oversized valve, then your distance between the valve frame and the, sin and the coronary ostia can be small and vice versa. So we'll get to that later on. So what are the risks again? So a small sinus, a high valve implant, low coronary implants, uh, burgeoning leaflet calcification. So if there is excessive leaflet calcification, that can also uh, impede uh, coronary flow. And then particular bioprosthetic valves, and we're going to illustrate that later on. We have the stented valves, stentless valves, and then stented valves with internally mounted leaflets. And especially the stented valves with externally mounted leaflets, like the mitra flow, are notorious for being associated with coronary obstruction. And this is how these valves look like. So the mitra flow and the trifecta, the, the leaflets are sutured on the outside of the posts as compared to, for instance, a perimount where the leaflets are within the post. And so the posts basically for, um, make a certain barrier between the leaflets and the coronary ostia on the outside that is not present with mitral flow and trifecta. And this is uh, the importance of the coronary sinus. So if you have a small sinus relative to the aortic annulus and you implant a large valve relative to the sinus, then your distance between the coronary ostia and your valve frame will be small. The smaller that distance, the higher the likelihood of uh, ending up with a coronary obstruction. And there the cutoff uh, seems to be between three to four millimeters. Then the distance from the coronary ostia to the annulus, if it's less than 12 millimeters, then again, you enter a potential danger zone for coronary obstruction. And also a non-coaxial valve implantation can be associated with coronary obstructions. And this is illustrated in this drawing. When here there is a coaxial implant, you see that there is a certain distance between the coronary ostium and the frame, but if it's tilted, then you tilt the valve and you may tilt it towards one of the coronary ostia. And then, of course, you will close the gap between the frame and the ostium. And by doing so, you can uh, occlude uh, the ostium. Also, when you have a small sinus, then whenever, whatever valve you will implant, there will be no distance between the coronary ostium and the framework. So that this makes sense, but I think it's quite visual uh, to, uh, now to, to have this in the back of your mind. So again, if the distance between the coronary ostium and your virtual uh, valve frame is below uh, three millimeters, then you are at a high risk for a coronary obstruction. If it's between three and six, there is an intermediate risk. And this is illustrated in this slide, where uh, by CT scanning, you delineate your uh, valve uh, framework, and then you look for the coronary ostium, and then you measure the distance. And in this study by Ribeiro, published in the European Heart Journal, it was clear that uh, in the patients who had a left coronary or right coronary obstruction, the distance between uh, the coronary ostium and the valve frame was typically below four millimeters, whereas in the control arm, in patients who did not have 
um, a coronary obstruction, the majority of uh, distances were above four millimeters. So I think this is quite um, a good illustration that uh, this distance is an important parameter to take into account uh, when dealing with these, with these patients. Uh, this is another uh, this is the, another retrospective study by Ribeiro where they looked into uh, is there a difference between the valve designs in terms of the risk for coronary obstruction? Do you see more coronary obstruction with the self-expanding valve or with the balloon expanding valve? And is there a difference between native valves and uh, valve and valve procedures? Well, clearly uh, the valve and valve procedures are associated with the majority of the coronary obstructions and in their series and this is with first generation devices uh, the self-expanding balloon uh, the self-expanding valve was associated with less coronary obstruction than the balloon expandable valve and this is in contradiction with data from uh, Richard Jabour uh, published la last year in uh, in Jack where uh, apparently the self-expanding as uh, self-expandable valve was associated with more coronary obstruction than the balloon expandable valve again this is retrospective analysis, so we always have to take this with a grain of salt. I do believe that the major takeaway is that valve and valve procedures are at highest risk for coronary obstruction relative to the native uh, uh, valve implants. And whether there is a difference between self-expanding and balloon expandable devices, well, I think the only answer to that question would be a randomized trial. But again, coronary obstruction is a relatively rare event. It occurs in less than 1% of the cases, so you would need a lot of patients to demonstrate any difference between the two of them. This is the timing of coronary obstruction and of course as expected the majority of coronary occlusions or obstructions will happen on day zero or within the first couple of days after the valve implant but still and this is quite striking and not totally unexpected that late coronary obstructions may happen more often with self-expanding uh, devices versus the balloon expandable devices and why would that be of course I think it has to do with uh, the design of the frame so you have cobalt chromium in the balloon expanding devices and you have the nitinol frame uh, with the self-expanding and we know from our data in the thorax center that out to if we so we have a couple of patients so i think it were 50 patients where we did a ct scan before six months after the valve implant and six years after the valve implant well between six months and six years the valve was expanding further so that means that the core valve keeps on expanding uh, after, I mean, even years after the valve implant. But then, of course, you might, and you might understand that this might affect the risk for a late obstruction. And I think this partly explains that you may end up having a higher risk for very late coronary obstructions with a self-expanding valve as compared to a balloon expandable valve. And then once it occurs, the, these delayed uh, occlusions, then they are associated with a high mortality rate. And this attests probably to the difficulty re-engaging these coronaries after the a valve and valve procedure or another a valve and a native valve procedure. So this is a, these are two examples from the paper of Richard where we also collaborated. This is a, an early uh, delayed coronary obstruction, so before hospital discharge. This was a patient with a uh, self, so a self-expanding a core valve implant and evolute. Three days after the valve implant, there was some haziness there agent is there and they ended up uh, stenting the patient so this was uh, a early delayed and then a late delayed event was in a valve and valve this was a paramount 25 they implanted a sapien xt and then one year they also um, during that index procedure they also did a stenting of the left main and then one year after the tavi the patient was admitted with uh, an acs and they found uh, some problems with the, cor with the right coronary and the left coronary. And eventually, so this was at the index and this is at follow-up. So there is no right coronary visible and there is something going on, some haziness uh, at the left coronary. And the patient was, after several attempts, sent for surgery. And it turned out that there was leaflet obstruction of both ostia. So one year after the procedure. So it, it can occur very late after the procedure. So what are the preventive 
techniques. There are several uh, things that we can do. First of all, you can do a very comprehensive pre-procedural planning and do your, your simulations and, and determine the distance between the coronary osteum and your anticipated valve frame. And if it's below three millimeters, you might want to think about preventive measures. And the important preventive measures that you can do are the chimney technique and the basilica, or you can also select a completely repositionable device. So if you implant the device, and if you're not happy because there is some kind of coronary obstruction, you would uh, reposition and put the device either, uh, I mean, lower at that point. So this is how the basilica uh, works. Uh, it is quite a complex procedure, but the concept is that you try to lacerate the leaflets. And you can do this for native valves, but also for um, bioprosthetic valves. And then the procedure goes like this. You use a Amplatz or a JL, a left Judkins catheter, uh, with a Confianza Pro wire. You have a snare waiting for you in the left ventricular outflow tract, and you try to perforate the leaflet and then enter the LVOT and then snare and then exteriorize uh, your, your wire. The devices that you need are two guiding catheters, then your uh, Confianza Pro wire, and you need to electrify the wire, and you do that by connecting the hemostat and then electrifying the hemostat. It is quite laborious. I think it adds a significant time to the procedure, and it definitely adds complexity to the procedure. So the question is whether this is a viable solution over time. This is how it looks like, a mitral flow valve, they are with their, multi with, with their Amplatz catheter in the left coronary sinus. Here is the, um, the Confianza wire that perforated the leaflet and is being snared in the left ventricular outflow tract. You exteriorize and so you have a loop and then you, by pulling and electrifying the wire, you are able to lacerate uh, the leaflets. Another technique is the chimney technique. In the chimney technique, you, you will implant a, uh, a stent preventive, as a preventive measure, and the stent will protrude from the ostium of the right or the left coronary and then into the sinus or above the sinus. The question here is that the longevity of the stent and stent patency over time is unclear and it will be hardly impossible to re-engage the coronary ostium if there, if there are some issues from varying from a thrombotic occlusion or anything else related uh, to the stent itself. This is a case that we did a couple of, uh, I think, two years ago. Uh, this is a patient with a mitral flow, so a very small annulus. And then, uh, as you can see here, the leaflets are higher than the ostium or extend beyond the ostium of the left main. This is another representation where you have here the coronary of the ostium, uh, the coronary ostium of the left main, and then a distance to our virtual valve of 4.3 millimeters, but, but more importantly, the leaflets extend beyond the ostium. So you can imagine that if you would implant a valve in valve, that the leaflets might be pushed away uh, in front of the coronary ostium and obstruct the coronary ostium. So we were not, uh, so we were very reluctant to proceeding without a preventive measure. So we implanted a core or an evolute and then decided also to do a chimney uh, technique. That turned out to go pretty well. And we did a CT scan afterwards and here you see a, a wide open uh, stent protruding the sinuses and also entering the left main. So there's another example of an 86-year-old frail patient who was uh, also treated with a um, TAVI. And uh, here we assess the coronary or the aortic root, including the coronary ostia, and we have our virtual implant and we measure the distance between the coronary ostium and our virtual implant. It was deemed to be six millimeters, so not really at risk for an early obstruction in this native uh, valve. So we proceeded with uh, a valve implant, and uh, this one is not running, so can we try to make it run? I don't know, but this was. Uh, after the first implant, we had a we had a at least moderate uh, para, paravalvular leak, so we were not happy with that. So we proceeded with a balloon dilatation, so post still, and this was our final result. So, if anything, a trivial PVL, and also a patent coronaries. Patient was sent to the ICU. In that particular time, we were still sending systematically our patients to the ICU. Nowadays, our patients just go back to the ward. But back then, 
this was the EKG at admission at the ICU. And then during uh, her stay at the ICU, we were seeing dynamic EKG changes and chest pain. So we brought the patient back. This is a JL 3.5. We maneuver ourselves more or less coaxial to the to the frame uh, to the coronary, but we were not able to enter the uh, through the frame at that at this point. But you definitely see some haziness here at the ostium of the left main. Patient was stable, so we proceeded with a IVUS because we wanted to know so what is what's going on? Did we did we damage? Did something happen at the at the left main, or is there an issue related to the sinuses? And so we're pulling back from the LAD into the left main. And there is some disease, of course, what you can expect in an 86-year-old. And the more proximal we get, you all of a sudden see a dissection flap, which is almost, uh, it's hugging the, the catheter there. And then as, as we are going more towards the ostium, you will see that there is a dissection there in the sinus. So basically, th there is a traumatic dissection following the post dilatation uh, that extended into the left main, and we ended up stenting that ostium and had a very good result at the end. So I think in conclusion, coronary obstruction is and should be a rare event and should occur less than 1% of your cases. There are early versus late obstructions, and I try to explain to you that also late obstructions are uh, a reality. There are established risk factors, but nowadays we have some preventive techniques that seem to be somewhat complex, but we need to be aware of their existence. Thank you for your attention.